Hello and welcome to today's webinar, What You Need to Know About Over-the-Counter Treatments for Psoriatic Disease. My name is Bev Bromfield and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. Before we begin, discussion today may include a variety of products which are not endorsed by the National Psoriasis Foundation. Some products, however, may have the NPF seal of recognition, which means manufacturers have gone through an application, product review, and approval process, which includes independent testing, indicating the product doesn't irritate skin or joints for those who have psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, sensitive skin, or joint mobility issues. NPF recommends all individuals with psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis, check with their healthcare provider before using any over-the-counter products since it could contain ingredients that initiate a flare or interfere with prescribed medications or therapy. Since some of you may be new to the foundation, here's a little background about who we are, our mission, and what we do. For over 50 years, the National Psoriasis Foundation has served the more than 8 million individuals in the U.S. living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Founded from a tiny classified newspaper ad in Portland, Oregon, the NPF mission is to drive efforts to cure psoriatic disease and improve the lives of those affected. After completing one of the most ambitious strategic plans in its history, the National Psoriasis Foundation launched a new five-year strategic plan in July 2019. With a continued focus on a life free of psoriatic disease and its burdens, NPF remains committed to finding a cure for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis while supporting individuals to live longer and healthier lives. Over the next five years, NPF will focus on achieving three goals. Lead collaborative transformational research in psoriatic disease. Increase the lifespan and health of individuals living with psoriatic disease secure the human, technological, and financial resources necessary to achieve NPS mission-related goals. By viewing today's program, you've already taken a step towards expanding your knowledge about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, moving towards a better understanding of what it means to live with psoriatic disease. A few of the many ways that NPF supports the goal of leading collaborative transformational research includes, today NPF has funded over 28 million in grants and fellowships. That includes almost 3 million in grant and fellowship funding announced July 2nd. NPF grant mechanisms support all stages of research and careers. Our efforts focus on areas of unmet need and are often conducted in partnership with research stakeholders with whom we collaborate. In addition to funding outside grants and fellowships, the NPF also leads research initiatives such as the Psoriasis Prevention Initiative and the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant, which are new to the foundation. The Psoriasis Prevention Initiative was developed at the recommendation of the Psoriasis Prevention Initiative Steering Committee, who urged a definition of prevention to better guide the proposal development, and that's how it expanded to include disease relapse and comorbidities. NPF plans to invest $6.5 million over five years in this effort. The second initiative is the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant, which aims to develop a diagnostic test for psoriatic arthritis. This could significantly reduce the time between onset of symptoms and the diagnosis. This is important because we know as little as six months of delay between onset of symptoms of psoriatic arthritis and start of treatment can lead to permanent joint damage. This slide highlights four NPF research efforts that you can be part of. Launched in 2015, the NPF Corona National Psoriasis Patient Registry is the largest independent observational registry of psoriasis patients in the United States. Currently rebranding to Core Evitas, this registry collects and studies patient health information, allowing researchers to compare the safety and effectiveness of psoriasis treatments, better understand conditions that are related to psoriasis, and explore history of the disease. There are currently more than 12,700 patients enrolled at more than 270 sites across the country. Your dermatologist may be enrolled as an NPF Corivitas National Psoriasis Patient Registry site. Not sure if they are, ask. If they're not, encourage them to join. The LIGHT study is a real-world research study that compares the effectiveness of home versus office-based UVB phototherapy treatment of psoriasis. Entry criteria for the study are simple. You must be age 12 or older, have plaque or good tape psoriasis, and be a candidate for office or home phototherapy. There's no washout of topical, oral, or biologic medications, and the study is designed to be easily incorporated into routine patient care. It is also unique because it includes equal representation of all skin phototypes. 
Citizen Scientist is a platform where you as a patient answer survey questions, which you and researchers can analyze for trends and new insights. Citizen Scientist is currently being revitalized for greater community benefit. The NPF Annual Survey is a data collection effort the Foundation has conducted for two decades. This important research conducted each fall provides insight into the lived experience of individuals with psoriasis, including quality of life and unmet needs. If you are contacted about this annual survey, we would appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. To achieve the Foundation's goals as mentioned, please support our mission through donations or by participating in virtual or live Team NPF events such as Stamp Out Psoriasis, Walk or Cycle events. You can learn more at psoriasis.org forward slash donate or teamnpf.org. On behalf of the National Psoriasis Foundation, thank you for attending today's webinar. Will you learn more about where over-the-counter products fit into your overall treatment plan, what ingredients are fine to use and those that should be avoided, types of over-the-counter products such as soaps, moisturizers, shampoos, or those for scale removal, itch, and or skin discoloration, resources to help with selection of appropriate products, and available treatment options. Now I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, dermatologist Dr. Stephen Feldman. Dr. Feldman, a dermatologist and dermatopathologist, is the director of the Psoriasis Treatment Center at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center. He is also the professor of dermatology, pathology, and public health sciences at Wake Forest University School of Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Dr. Feldman specializes in psoriasis treatment and has made significant contributions to the understanding of dermatologic healthcare delivery, from demonstrating the quality of medical dermatology services, defining the role of dermatologists, to assessing cost effectiveness of dermatologic treatment. Dr. Feldman is a member of the National Psoriasis Foundation's Medical Board and in 2019 received the Foundation's Outstanding Educator in Psoriatic Disease Award. Per expertscape.com, Dr. Feldman is rated as the number one expert on psoriasis in the world. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Stephen Feldman, who will present today's webinar, What You Need to Know About Over-the-Counter Treatments for Psoriatic Disease. Please welcome Dr. Feldman. Beth, thank you so much for that kind introduction. The last I looked, I had dropped to number three on Expertscape's list. It's really a pleasure to, to do this um, program. The Psoriasis Foundation has been such a wonderful organization for me and my patients. When I first became a psoriasis specialist about, gosh, nearly 30 years ago, I, I knew nothing about psoriasis management and I learned all about it by attending programs that the National Psoriasis Foundation put on for physicians. and. Uh, it's my pleasure to share some of the information in, in a National Psoriasis Foundation program for patients. You know, you look at my disclosures and uh, basically I, I may mention a variety of products and I think more likely than not, I've taken money from companies that uh, made those products. So feel free to keep that in mind. So first, let me just describe my understanding of uh, how to treat psoriasis in general. So when I see patients with psoriasis, I've made that diagnosis, I wanna make sure I address their psychosocial needs. One way to do that is to encourage patients to join the National Psoriasis Foundation. It's a great way to learn about all the treatment options in depth. I think it's a, a, a unique resource. I wish I had something equivalent for all my dermatology patients. Next, I ask patients if they're having any joint symptoms. And if they are, I'd like them to see a, a joint specialist, a rheumatologist, uh, while they're waiting to get into the rheumatologist, I think taking some over-the-counter ibuprofen uh, would probably be a good thing for them to do. Many of the treatments that I use for the skin, the prescription products I prescribe, will also help the joints. And then we get into treating the skin. I'd, I'd like to think of psoriasis as almost two different diseases. One is a, a limited form of psoriasis, just less than a few percent of the body surface area covered. And for those patients, putting creams or ointments on all the spots is practical. And then that's what we use. We use topical treatments. And some of these can be over-the-counter products, uh, but mostly when they're seeing me, it's prescription drugs. If it's extensive disease, if there's so much psoriasis that you can't possibly put topicals on all the spots, you've got to treat the entire skin at once. And you can do that effectively with either phototherapy or an internal medicine. So with that as a general background, let's talk about uh, treatment options for the patients first who have relatively limited uh, psoriasis, less than 3% of their body covered. So if they were seeing me in the office, I would be prescribing 
super strong topical cortisone medicines that relieve the inflammation in the skin very rapidly. I used to do, use the topical steroids along with topical vitamin D-like drugs or topical vitamin A drugs, but I think that just adds to the complexity of treatment. And it's hard enough for a patient to put one thing on well, trying to get them to do multiple things is even a bigger problem. So just the topical cortisone alone may do the trick. There's also some UV laser treatments that can be done for lo localized spots in some offices. You, you have to come in, I don't know, maybe 20 times to get the spot treated, and it's not a permanent cure. So most patients are getting along with some kind of topical cortisone medicine. But there are over-the-counter options, and these are great, especially for the patient before they ever get to the dermatologist. If they have relatively mild disease, and they may be able to control their symptoms with just what's available over the counter. And I'll go through these, the moisturizers, the topical cortisone, which the over-the-counter topical cortisone is much weaker than the ones I prescribe when people come in. And then topical tar preparations. Tars are uh, anti-inflammatory too. So let's talk about the moisturizers first. The moisturizers, what do they do? They moisturize the skin. They improve the skin barrier. And by improving the skin barrier function, keeping irritants out, that may reduce inflammation. And so there may be some direct effect of improving the inflammation of psoriasis with the use of a moisturizer. But the other thing a moisturizer does is it changes the appearance of the scale. It makes the scale clear to light. So the scale disappears. It's still there, but it disappears. You don't see it anymore. And so many patients who have very white, flaky um, psoriasis may appreciate using a moisturizer to make that uh, scale disappear. You still see the underlying redness of the psoriasis, but the scaliness is no longer apparent. Uh, there are many different types of moisturizers. They vary in how thick they are. So lotions and creams are kind of the, the, the typical ones. Ointments are much thicker and greasier. You can even find waxy ones. Some things are like almost as thick as a candle. They're, they're wax. And then oils could be used too. They go on, maybe even spread even easier than a cream would, but they could be a little messy. And it's hard to say which one of these is best because different people prefer different things. Some people might like something that's really thick and stays on. I don't know, O'Keefe's hand product or something, um, bag balm, you know, some, some really thick thing. Uh, other people are like, oh, this greasy stuff gets on my silk clothes. I hate it. They may prefer some lighter cream-like product. There's many different brands. Some of the brands that um, sell products so, to dermatologists so much that they call on dermatologists are the CeraVe, Eucerin, and Cetaphil lines. And they have different types of moisturizers that that they may feel are specific for psoriasis like skin. I don't know that there's any proof that these are better for psoriasis than any other moisturizer, but you could look for the National Psoriasis Foundation Seal of Recognition program on, on these products. Personally, I believe that one moisturizer probably works better than all the others, and it's the one that the patient wants to use. If they find one they really like, that may be the best one. Along with moisturizers, consider using a mild cleanser to avoid dry skin. A Dove soap or a Cetaphil cleanser, very mild. I'd stay away from harsh bar soaps like Ivory, Irish Spring, things like that. I think anything that dries your skin out could make the psoriasis worse. And I'd stay away from harsh liquid detergent products. So uh, a, a lot of the liquid cleansing products are detergents that are really great for taking oil off of dishes. And you don't want one of those because they'll take the oil out of your skin and, and leave the skin dry and cracked and make the psoriasis potentially worse, cause more inflammation. So I would pick a mild bar soap like Dove or a non-soap cleansing product like Cetaphil cleanser, something in, in those categories. If you have really thick scale over the lesions, treating the underlying inflammation can get rid of the scale, or you can go directly with something that's designed to dissolve thick scale. And as I mentioned, moisturizers make scale disappear, but the scales don't go away. The scales are still there. Descaling agents, certain acid products like lactic acid and salicylic acid in low concentrations 
or urea cream can be used to make the scale come off. This can be particularly helpful when you have really thick scales on the sole of the feet. Sometimes psoriasis causes very thick scale to develop. Some doctors wonder whether that thick scale prevents their treatments from penetrating and therefore they'll recommend uh, what are called keratolytics, something that will break up the scale. And you can get over the counter urea, salicylic acid, or lactic acid products that will do this. So one of the lactic acid products is amlactin, salicylic acid products. Well, there's Keralite gel, which I think is a 6% salicylic acid. They also make salicylic acid wart removers that could be used to remove thick scale. And urea cream in concentrations of maybe 20 to 40% might be found in, in products especially designed to remove scale from the feet. All right, moving on from the moisturizers, let's talk about anti-inflammatory treatment. And as I mentioned, the, the, the sort of the go-to drug in, in dermatologist's office for inflammatory skin diseases would be a strong top of cortisone medicine. And those are too strong to be made over the counter. They have too much risk, but hydrocortisone is very mild, very low risk for most areas where it's used. And uh, so it's safe enough to sell over the counter. You can get the 1% hydrocortisone over the counter, you get 0.5%. I would go with the 1% for pretty much any skin problem. You can get it as a cream or ointment. The ointments tend to be more potent. They also moisturize the skin at the same time. So I'd be looking to get a 1% hydrocortisone ointment if I was trying to use it to treat psoriasis. If you, if you find ointments really disgustingly greasy and don't want to use them, then a hydrocortisone cream it would be entirely reasonable to use, especially for the face if you didn't want a Vaseline-like stuff on your face. And the hydrocortisone ointment could be used twice a day to treat areas of psoriasis. And it, it may well be effective on sensitive areas like the eyelids, face and the ears, maybe underarms, the groin area. It's probably not going to be strong enough to make much of a difference on elbows or knees, but there'd be no harm trying it. The moisturization from the ointment and what little anti-inflammatory benefit you get from the hydrocortisone in there might be enough to control the disease. And I really wouldn't worry about side effects of over-the-counter hydrocortisone unless I was using it around the eyes. Maybe you could have some problem on the eyes or maybe exacerbate rosacea, redness of the face with really long-term hydrocortisone use. But for most areas, hydrocortisone, over-the-counter hydrocortisone strength topical steroid is so safe, it would be hard to run into much of a problem with it. There is another um, anti-inflammatory that you don't need to see a doctor to get, and that's tar products. So uh, there's this MG17 tar ointment, uh, there's tea gel as a shampoo, there's tar bath oil. These things can be very effective if you can stand them. Now, the problem is they smell like tar. And that's terrible. Now, for the first, I don't know, 25 years, I was taking care of psoriasis patients. I wasn't terribly excited about uh, recommending tar because I really didn't know how it worked. I mean, it's been used for centuries for the treatment of psoriasis, but why it worked, we don't know. We didn't know. But more in the last few years, research has been done proving that tar products work by binding to what's called the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. This, this is a fascinating, evolutionarily conserved anti-inflammatory pathway. And so I'm not sure what the natural substances are in the body that bind to these receptors, but tar will bind to these receptors and they, it will downregulate inflammation. And so you could use this on the elbows and knees, you could use it the, the shampoo for the scalp. If you were using it on the elbows and knees and really wanted it to work well, or, or for the feet, uh, you could put it on, wrap it with saran wrap and leave it on overnight. Sometimes I'll have patients take an old tennis sock, cut the toe off and use that over the saran wrap to hold the saran wrap in place. That's, that may be a, a helpful approach to keep that plastic in place overnight. And, and tar products can be very effective. That may be the, one of the most effective over-the-counter treatments for uh, psoriasis. And in theory, you could use it along with salicylic acid. Some of these over-the-counter tar products might even have some salicylic acid in them to help get rid of the scale while the tar gets rid of the inflammation. For the scalp, uh, scalp psoriasis is so common, so frustrating, so hard to treat with 
creams or ointments or even liquids. Uh, so using a medicated shampoo would be a, a, a real good first line option. You got a lot of options. I think the tar gel product, uh, the tea gel might be a really good one to use. The others, head and shoulder, Nizerol, they probably kill off some of the yeast on the scalp that, that might be causing the psoriasis to develop there. T-Sal is a salicylic acid shampoo that might be good for trying to remove thick scales from the scalp. With any of these, I would probably put them in to the scalp, leave them there for as long as you reasonably can, 10, 15 minutes before you rinse them out to give the medicine in them the maximum time to, to come out of the shampoo and onto the skin, into the skin to have its maximal benefit. Body folds are another sensitive area. Uh, the hydrocortisone might work well for the face, underarms, groin. For genital involvement, zinc oxide paste can be very useful for keeping the irritants off the skin and may have some direct benefit. If there's itching, a couple of things can be useful. The hydrocortisone can be useful. The tar products are probably very useful for getting rid of the itch and psoriasis, uh, whether it's on the scalp or anywhere else. There's a really cool uh, over-the-counter product called Tricolm, which I love. I think it's a strontium-based compound. And it works because the, the nerves that conduct itch signals use calcium. But the chemists in the audience probably realize that strontium is in the same column of the periodic table as calcium. And those nerves, when they see the strontium, they probably think it's calcium and it gums up those calcium channels that the itch nerves use. And so it's so this, this trichome seems to be a very safe way to calm down itch in the skin. If itching is keeping somebody up at night, there's an over-the-counter antihistamine, Benadryl, diphenhydramine is the generic name, uh, that can be used that tends to make people sleepy. I'm not sure it would help the itch directly, but it certainly would help person sleep through it. And I would not use the topical diphenhydramine just because we see allergy to that develop in some patients. What are some other things to do to manage the itch? Make sure you're using myocleansers, using a moisturizer, low pH cleansers, Physohex, I think was one of them, uh, may help reduce itch. If you're sensitive to wool, if that makes you itch, avoid it. And maybe a cool washcloth or, or cooling your uh, moisturizers, your emollients, and using them cold might help calm itch down. But if you're itching that much, boy, I'd see a dermatologist get on some active treatment, get it all cleared up. Uh, what else can you do? Capsaicin creams and lotions. Capsaicin is the active ingredient in chili peppers. And it's been reported to help itch. If you put it on, it'll cause a burning sensation of the skin as it releases neurotransmitters from the skin. And when you use up all those neurotransmitters, there's none left for the itching. And so perhaps it can be use, a useful product. How about skin discoloration? Skin discoloration, the best treatment for that is just to give it time for the color to come back. The inflammation of psoriasis can affect the pigment cells of the skin and leave lighter or darker skin in its wake as the psoriasis clears up. Some patients are very bothered by the discoloration. I think the best, best treatment is to wait till it goes away. There are things you could do, bleaching creams like hydroquinone, but you run the risk of ending up with multiple colors, not just the dark area could get too light. If it gets, some of it gets on the light skin, it could get even lighter. Giving it time or trying to control your psoriasis really well before you get skin discoloration would be another good approach. There's some things I recommend avoiding in all of these products. I'd avoid fragrance because so many of my patients are allergic to fragrances. And so I'd avoid that. Alcohol, I guess, could be drying, but I'm not too, too worried about it. A product Maybe marked natural does not necessarily mean it's gentle. I don't know if being natural really means anything. Some of my colleagues would say, yeah, poison ivy's natural, feces is natural. You know, it doesn't make it good. So you might, when it comes to different moisturizers, all the different ingredients, try to find one that's fragrance-free, find one that you like using. That may be the best approach. One question I hear a lot is, well, what about CBD? You know, cannabidiol. Is it good? Is it helpful? I have no idea. I, I doubt it, but the, the National Psoriasis Foundation Medical Board knows this is of great interest to, to people, and they are actively trying to collate all the evidence available and evaluate as best they can. I suspect there really haven't been enough really good studies done to know whether it helps or not. 
But if you're using a moisturizer that has CBD in it and it helps, great. It could just be the moisturizer, but who cares? As long as you're getting better, that's great. Now, we've mostly been talking about what to do when there's limited areas of psoriasis. When the psoriasis is extensive, on a prescription basis, we could do prescription phototherapy in our office. We could prescribe home phototherapy units for patients. We can give them internal medicines like an oral retinoid, a vitamin A related medicine, acetretin to make light treatments more effective. Methotrexate's another older medicine that's basically mildly poisons the immune system to calm the psoriasis down, has a lot of potential side effects. A Premolast is a newer oral agent, not as effective as some of the other new drugs, but it's a pill and it seems to be pretty safe. And then there's biologics that are extraordinarily expensive, but amazingly effective and amazingly safe. My goodness, they revolutionized the management of psoriasis. When I took over our psoriasis population back you know, nearly 30 years ago, we did a lot of handholding and not a lot of clearing people up. Now, because of the biologics, we do a lot of clearing people up. But before you go to the dermatologist, if you want some over-the-counter options, there are some things to do. Phototherapy is one of them. You don't necessarily have to go to a dermatologist to get ultraviolet light. You could go out in the sun. That's a great way to get ultraviolet light. Tar products can also be used over extensive areas. You can buy a big jar of a tar ointment, but it, it would be messy. You could wrap your whole body in saran wrap all over that psoriasis. You're not gonna be around anybody. You're gonna wear, wanna wear old pajamas because uh, it'll stain stuff too. And then there's oral vitamin A. And you have to be real careful with the oral vitamin A. It's a lot like acetretin. And vitamin A, if you're a woman of childbearing potential, can cause severe birth defects. So if you're a woman of childbearing potential, I do not recommend you take over-the-counter vitamin A. But if you're not a woman of childbearing potential and you're looking for a low-cost option, you could consider taking some vitamin A along with some ultraviolet light. But vitamin A can also affect the liver, can affect uh, blood fat levels, the triglycerides. So you'd want to have some blood tests done too to monitor for side effects. And if you're going to go into the doctor and have monitoring, well, then you may want to go beyond those topicals, uh, the over-the-counter topicals and get a real prescription drug. Uh, what are some other things you could do? Uh, lifestyle changes, uh, diet and weight loss is uh, probably a good thing for people who need a diet and weight loss. I mean, it's good in general. If it helps the psoriasis, which it might a little bit, it's probably a bonus. So, uh, you know, a good healthy lifestyle is probably a good thing. Maybe avoid alcohol. If you're having joint trouble, there's over-the-counter medicines for joint pain, but I would see a rheumatologist if you're having any joint pain at all, because psoriatic arthritis can cause destruction of the joints, permanent destruction. You know, the skin, when psoriasis clears up, doesn't usually leave a scar, but when it destroys the joint and you, you lose joint function forever, that's really bad. And so at the earliest sign of psoriatic arthritis, I would be evaluated by a rheumatologist, let them do x-rays, measure range of motion, make sure that I wasn't developing permanent um, deformity. There may be other complementary and integrative medicine things that are recommended. I, I can't tell you that they're effective. If there was a really good study proving that they were effective, they would be standard medicine. They wouldn't be called complementary. So almost by definition, complementary medicine doesn't have the same kind of proof that standard medical care does. And maybe some individual finds something that they think works for them, but I don't have any proof that any of these things work in any kind of general way. And then the last thing I want to point out on this slide is that I've seen over the years companies advertise their banana peel extract product or their Amerigel as FDA proven for the treatment of psoriasis based on scientific evidence, things like that. You can basically sell almost anything as an over-the-counter treatment for psoriasis and say that the FDA approved it as long as you have 2% tar in there. If there's 2% tar in there along with your banana peel extract, you can say, hey, We've got a banana peel extract and it's FDA approved for the treatment of psoriasis. So if you see, you know, ads for some, some claim that says it's FDA approved, yeah, there may be some FDA approved product in there, but it's probably not going to be anything other than over-the-counter tar. Here's some other resources that I recommend. The American Academy of Dermatology really wants to help people with skin disease and they've got information on psoriasis, including non-prescription medications. My favorite source for information on psoriasis is of course, 
the National Psoriasis Foundation, and they were brilliant to get the website www.psoriasis.org assigned to them, and they've got information on over-the-counter products. And WebMD also has some good information on things you can do for in the way of topical treatments for psoriasis. And with that, Bev, uh, I hope we have some questions because uh, this is a great topic to discuss. Oh, we sure do. Thank you, Dr. Feldman. That was a great webinar about the over-the-counter treatments for psoriasis. So our first question, you didn't mention children. Are there types of lotions, shampoos, or other products that work better for children? Not that I know of. I think for children, you want to find one in a pretty container that they are that, that they want to use. If you found a pump moisturizer that made it easier for you to apply it in some way, uh, that might be good. But everything I think that we've talked about in terms of over-the-counter products, they're safe enough to be over-the-counter. They're probably safe enough for use in children. For example, the over-the-counter hydrocortisone would probably be safe enough to use even in a young infant. I'd feel comfortable putting it on diaper rash or something if, if, if they needed it, at least for a short while. I might not use the tar products in the very young people. I guess in, some, in theory, the tar products could have some mild carcinogenic properties. I think an adult, they probably minimal and wouldn't matter. If, if you were using it in a young child where the absorption through the skin is much greater than it is an adult, maybe there would be a little bit more worry about that. Are there any risks using an over-the-counter product while also using a biologic? Uh, that's another great question. Our biologics are fabulous drugs, but patients may have a few spots left. The biologic didn't clear up. And uh, you could use any of these over-the-counter things in conjunction with biologics. Absolutely. You could even use prescription strength steroids if you were on a biologic. But using a tar or a hydrocortisone, using moisturizers, all that would be entirely reasonable. Along those lines, are there lotions and creams that are better for specific types of psoriasis? I don't think so. Let's see what kinds of psoriasis we're talking about. So there's plaque type, the usual type, and, and you know, whatever moisturizer you think is best that you, you're comfortable using is probably fine for that. The thicker ones, the waxier, thicker ones might last longer on the skin and be more a little a little touch more effective if they're not bothering you, you don't, and you don't mind using them. If you've got gut tape psoriasis, that's little tiny spots of psoriasis all over. It would be hard to moisturize those with one of the thick agents. I guess you'd want a thin one that was that spread easily. If you've got erythrodermic or pustular psoriasis, those are severe disease. You need to be in a dermatologist's office doing more than just moisturizing. You need some aggressive treatment for those. Scalp psoriasis, if you're African-American and you have a dry, scaly scalp psoriasis and you don't mind using oils on your head, oils might be a great way to go. There's a prescription strength cortisone oil product, but you could use, you know, any kind of oil might, might help reduce the scaling of the scalp. In the genital area, you probably don't even need a moisturizer. And so since you mentioned scalp, What's the most effective over-the-counter treatment for scalp psoriasis? You mentioned a couple in your presentation. Yeah, I love that question. And I love it because there's no evidence, there's no data on which to go. I don't know of any head-to-head -head studies that have compared, say, tar shampoo to the ketoconazole, the antifungal shampoo, or to head and shoulders. So I don't know. I don't know that any of these shampoos is more effective than another. My guess is that the one that's the toughest to use, the, the tar one, because it smells very strong, is probably the most effective. If you use the tar shampoo, because it has direct anti-inflammatory effects on psoriasis, my guess is it would probably be the most effective. But again, I, I don't have any uh, scientific proof of that. And another participant is indicating my psoriasis has been clear for two months now. Should I continue to use the psoriasis shampoos and creams as a preventive measure? I, I think you should. Well, I don't know about you in particular. I don't know what you should do. But in general, if you've been fortunate enough to clear up the psoriasis, it's a chronic disease and it's likely to come back, you know, especially on the scalp. So I think using a medicated shampoo a couple times a week to help keep it from coming back would be a very reasonable thing to do.
what's a good solution for an itchy scalp? Someone's tried the over-the-counter shampoos and they don't seem to stop the itching. Yeah, well, you could go to a dermatologist and they could give you some strong cortisone liquid to apply to the scalp or a strong cortisone shampoo that could be used to relieve the inflammation in the scalp. But make sure you've maximized the benefit of over-the-counter products. If you put them in and use them as a shampoo, thinking you're gonna clean the psoriasis out and rinse it out right away, you may not have given the psoriasis, the medication enough time to really sink into the psoriasis. So you, one could try those medicated shampoos again, leaving them in for 20 minutes, you, you know, put them in maybe even before you get in the shower, leave them in there, watch some television, and then get in the shower, rinse them out or get in the shower, moisten the scalp, put the shampoo in, and then take a nice leisurely shower, washing the rest of your body while you leave that stuff on the scalp and really give it a chance to do its best before rinsing it out. And how about if someone, their back and arms itch after they take a shower, what can they use to stop the itching? There's a number of things that could cause itching from a hot shower. One is the heat, the other is the water. It's a very rare condition. I think I may have seen one or two cases in my 30 year career of aquagenic pruritus where water exposure causes itch. Uh, certainly more commonly a hot shower, just heat will cause some people's skin to break out in hives. And if that's the cause of the itch, an over-the-counter antihistamine might work for some people. You can get one that doesn't make people sleepy. Uh, we mentioned diphenhydramine can make people sleepy. Uh, loratadine, uh, the generic, the, the brand name is Claritin, but the generic name is loratadine and it's available as a generic, is a non-sedating antihistamine that might be useful for preventing itch if it's coming from a hive-like phenomenon due to the uh, heat or the water. And how dangerous are steroid creams and can they be used every day on the areas of itch? Is it okay to use steroids as an injection? You know, I try not to use the word steroid too much because there's all kind, different kinds of steroids. There's steroids that people use to cheat in athletics. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about hydrocortisone. Hydrocortisone, and it's something that the body's adrenal gland makes every morning. It's, it's critical to our lives. And then there's stronger versions of hydrocortisone that bind to the cortisone receptors. The super strong cortisone receptors, if you use them continuously, they can cause thinning of the skin. They could cause glaucoma, weight gain. There can be internal effects. They can turn off the body's natural adrenal gland production of steroids. I prescribe these super strong steroids every day, and I'm not, most of these side effects I've never seen in 30 years, but it certainly could happen, at least in theory. The over the counter stuff we talked about today. 1% hydrocortisone, it would be really difficult to have any kind of significant side effect from that other than maybe if it was used on the eyelids, you know, around the eyes too much and you were susceptible to glaucoma, maybe with really long-term use on the face, it could cause some redness and blood vessel changes on the face. But for the most part, it would be hard to get run into a problem from over-the-counter hydrocortisone. That's good to know. Are there any preservatives to avoid in over-the-counter topicals? Yes. If you are allergic to, to preservatives, you want to avoid the ones you're allergic to. If you're not allergic, then the preservatives are probably fine. I mean, they wouldn't be there if the, they weren't recognized as, as safe to use in general use. But it turns out a number of preservatives, people can have allergies to preservatives. When I'm recommending a moisturizer, I I would prefer the patient get a preservative-free one. I think CeraVe makes a preservative-free moisturizer, a moisturizer that has very little in it that anybody is allergic to. Are there any benefits to creams or lotions with vitamin E in them? Uh, no, I believe there's no benefit and there's a potential big downside. When you apply things to your skin, you can become allergic to them and you can actually become allergic to vitamin D. You know, if you're looking for a moisturizer, I'd probably find the simplest moisturizer that you like using that I could find. Plain Vaseline would be perfect. The more complicated it is, the more all natural stuff they're putting in there, fragrances and things to make it smell good, 
you, you run into more chance that it's going to be something that will either irritate or be allergic to the skin. Would the same principle also apply to vitamin E? Oh, did I not say vitamin E? I meant vitamin E. That, that's absolutely true of vitamin E. You want to avoid vitamin E. And how do you know when to move on from over-the-counter options and what treatments do you explore from there? Yeah, you know, I would talk to a dermatologist and uh, if, it's, if it's limited disease, just a couple spots and the over-the-counter options haven't worked, I would go see a dermatologist and get a stronger cortisone, a prescription strength one. You could get a vitamin D or vitamin A analog cream uh, that could be useful too. But the, usually the topical steroids are the way to go, I think, and unless you're really trying to avoid topical steroids. For the face or genital area, the vitamin D products and then there's protopic and elidel, which are non-steroid anti-topical anti-inflammatories that are excellent. The, the, one of the nice things about the topical steroids is they come in a variety of vehicles. So if you find ointments to be too messy, you get a cream. If you think creams are too messy, you can get a foam. If you think foams are too messy, you can get a spray. Just spray it on. It dries right out. You don't even know it's there. And it's anti-inflammatory uh, topical steroid. Works great. If the disease is extensive, Yes, methotrexate, I guess, is an option if your insurance company makes you, but I think I would want to take a biologic, one of these medications that blocks the, one of the signaling molecules that causes the psoriasis. So you're targeting the underlying problem, too much of this signaling molecule. I think that would be the better approach. And this is along a similar line. What makes some dermatologists stick to lotions for their patients when there are so many biologics available? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know where I practice. We've got many great dermatologists and I think all of them prescribe biologics. When they refer to me a, a patient, that patient has usually been through many different internal medicines, systemic treatments, biologics often for their psoriasis and they're really tough to treat. If there are doctors that don't prescribe biologics, it may be that they don't think that the the risk benefit is appropriate. They may be worried that the effect on the general immune system is not worth the benefit. Although if you look at the data, one of the one, one study found a, when they compared the, a biologic to not being on any internal medicine, any systemic therapy at all for psoriasis, there were fewer infections, fewer serious infections in the patients who were on the biologic than who weren't on any internal medicines. It was as though the biologic brought the patient's immune system back into balance and it was working better on the biologic than it, for fighting off severe infections than it was when the psoriasis had the immune system all out of whack. So, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it's a dermatologist who doesn't have a lot of experience with biologics, thinks that, you know, they should be prescribing things they have more experience with. Uh, it could be if, if that doctor has patients who have only very limited disease who really don't warrant biologic treatment, they would end up prescribing a lot of topical steroids and, and very little biologics. And certainly cost is a factor as well, correct? Yeah, cost is, is sort of a factor. If you're young and uninsured, I love it. I love treating people like that because if you're uninsured, I can often get free drug from the drug company, you know, unless you make a lot of money. If you're uninsured, it's, it's kind of perverse, but it, you might be the easiest patient for me to get drug for. I could probably get my choice of whichever one I wanted. If you're insured, the insurer is going to either cover it if, or they don't. If, or if they, if they do cover it, the copay may be high or low. If it's low, no problem. If they cover it and it's a high copay, there's often copayment assistance. If they deny it altogether, some of the drug companies, again, will give their drug away pretty much for free or nearly for free. So you could get people the drug. If you have Medicare insurance, Medicare may require you to fail methotrexate before they're going to pay for a biologic. So some people might not have great access, but even in that population, if the patient doesn't have a lot of money and the doctor prescribes a biologic, there may be support if, they, if the patient's low income to get that biologic covered for them. Great. Thank you. Uh, and you mentioned systemics earlier. How did the various over-the-counter topicals interact with systemic biologics? Are there any combinations to avoid? No, I don't think there are any combinations to avoid. Biologics 
are so well targeted, especially some of the newer ones. They're just like focused on the psoriasis so well. Uh, they don't have much in the way of side effects. And even the older ones, like the tumor necrosis factor inhibitors, Embrel, Humira, Remicade, you know, those drugs, despite being less targeted than the new things on psoriasis, still are extraordinarily effective, safe products and don't have very much at all in the way of drug interactions, at least certainly not with anything over the counter. And one last question. Can essential oils added to a carrier oil, fractionated coconut oil, for an example, be used on psoriasis? If so, which oils offer relief and what are those that you should avoid? I think this falls in that complementary and alternative medicine area where I could say with pretty much confidence that uh, we don't know. Uh, we don't have any data. I don't think there's any good evidence that they're that they're any more effective than Vaseline or, for that matter, Crisco or olive oil. I mean, I, I think they're, at best, they're probably a moisturizer. At worst, they may, if you're allergic to them, they might cause a, a, a reaction. So I, I would tend to shy away from things like that. But if somebody found some that, that they swear by that works for them, you know, I wouldn't stop them. Great. Well, thanks, Dr. Feldman, for your time to answer all the questions we received and for sharing your expertise about over-the-counter treatments. Uh, you provided a lot of useful information for our viewers today. So thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. In addition to the suggestions provided by Dr. Feldman, you can find additional information about products with the NPF seal of recognition at the website listed on the screen. You'll find a variety of products in the directory, which includes laundry detergent, dish soap, cleansers and shampoos, to bedding, humidifiers, and shaving cream. New products continue to be added, so check back on and off. Receive additional information about the use of natural products, lifestyle changes, mind and body practices through the Complementary and Integrative Medicine for Psoriatic Disease Guide. This quick guide provides a nice explanation of what complementary medicine and integrative medicine mean, along with alternative medicine, and offers examples with research for each. You can obtain a free copy by email by contacting the Patient Navigation Center. The Patient Navigation Center is the world's first personalized support center for people impacted by psoriatic disease. If you still have questions, would like additional information about treatment options, need help finding a physician, or are having issues with accessing treatments, contact our Patient Navigation Center by phone or email as indicated on the screen. You can also contact the Navigation Center to ask about connecting with others through the one-to-one -one program or to request the free complimentary and integrative medicine for psoriatic disease quick guide. Reach out at education at psoriasis.org or call 1-800-723-9166, option 1. In addition to this webinar, you can continue to learn about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis through NPS podcast series Sound Bites, which is available through Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Ghana, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, or a feed service of your choice. You can also access podcasts at the website listed here. If you'd like to hear more from Dr. Feldman, listen to episode number 106, Clearing Drop-Like Psoriasis Plaques, or you can join rheumatologist and dermatologist Dr. Joseph Marola and NPF's Chief Scientific and Medical Officer, Dr. Stacy Bell, as they bust myths about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis in episode number 120. After you view this webinar, please take the survey via the link you received to provide feedback about the presentation and content. Tell us what you think. We value and appreciate your comments. And finally, you can catch this webinar and other presentations in our webinar archive at psoriasis.org forward slash watch hyphen and hyphen listen. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for viewing what you need to know about over-the-counter treatments for psoriatic disease.